Well, the 31st lesson gets into the post-Hoover era and starts touching on the reasons for um, the election of Franklin Delano Roosevelt in 1932. Um, it also considers the reasons why the depression lasted so long. So these are just sort of the first bit. Anyways, the stuff about the reason for the length of the depression can and should be added to other essay questions about the degree to which the depression was solved by the New Deal or the degree to which um, the depression was worse than anything else. Um, a, a lot of this stuff will be very, very helpful across multiple essay questions. So you need to remember this in the larger context. The last bit looks at more acutely um, previous PEPs paper questions that have asked things about um, the degree to which the New Deal actually um, uh, solved the problems, uh, or sorry, rather, why Franklin Delano Roosevelt actually won the election uh, um, against Herbert Hoover. Now, let's crack on and look at the first little bit, which is the reasons why the Depression lasted so long. The first one has to do with the lack of international trade, and this is really twofold. Number one, there are issues that the Americans made worse or exacerbated, such as the passing of the Hawley-Smoot Tariff in 1930, which increased tariffs on imported goods, which had the consequence of leading to retaliatory tariffs against America. And um, in essence, slowing down international trade. A couple other issues, not to mention the fact that uh, in the United States, a lot of countries suffered a lack of purchasing power, which meant that they, um, with the reduced incomes due to the consequences of the crash and the depression, couldn't buy things, therefore tariff or not, they weren't buying anything to begin with. Therefore, the United States and all other countries really had difficulty selling their goods abroad, which did nothing but exacerbate the issues of the Great Depression. Um, uh, this really, I mean, I suppose you can mention that FDR does lower tariffs in 1934, but this remains a relative constant. Um, monetary policy. Now, a lot of monetarists, these are economists who focus on uh, the exchange and value of money, argue that the tight monetary policy by the Federal Reserve Board stifled the recovery. That is, the need to not lend um, when when companies that could have maybe perhaps expanded during the year of the depression could not gain the access to capital. People like Milton Friedman argued that the decline in the amount of money in circulation, Milton Friedman's a famous economist, famous um, famous of the Chicago School of Economists who argue in, um, above all the idea of trickle-down economics. The idea that the lack of money in circulation um, uh, sometimes comes before a depression and it's necessary to replenish the stock in order to stimulate growth, i.e. inject more money into the market. So between 1929 and 1933, the amount of money in circulation fell by 33%. And this is twofold. Number one, as a result of banking collapses and legitimately money disappearing. And number two, the fact that the American um, people aren't spending, they're hoarding their money, uh, they're keeping it in shoeboxes rather than putting it in banks. And the rise, um, from October 1931 in the discount rate from 1.5 to uh, 3.5 caused a 24% fall in industrial production. And this is um, and just an example of monetary policy uh, going wrong. And I'll explain that to you more if you want to know uh, more about discount rate and how that works uh, in lesson. The extent of the depression. Um, the other re another reason for its length and duration is the depth to which the American economy plunged. Um, no admin industry remained immune. We could very typically see, you know, an agricultural based recession as happened throughout the 1890s, but one where the industrial production continues to increase. In the Great Depression, everything suffered. And this prolongs the depression really two ways. Number one, there's an absence of alternative employment. So if you were in the car industry and that happened to be suffering, you couldn't necessarily go find a, a job as a farm laborer. So basically people were stuck all over the place. And also too, because of the whole issue of chronic overproduction, which was common in the 1920s, um, uh, it led to underconsumption. Okay, And almost all sectors of the economy get badly hit. Rural, as I sort of alluded to, and urban areas couldn't help each other. Inadequate government intervention. Um, and this is important to note. This is both a consequence of Hoover and a consequence of Franklin Roosevelt. What historians, and historians 
disagree on many things, particularly as we move towards Roosevelt and consider what we, we understand as the New Deal. Some people think, oh yes, maybe perhaps the New Deal solved the Great Depression. Historians are pretty unanimous on this. The Great Depression was not solved by the New Deal. The New Deal helped deal with some of the worst aspects of the Great Depression, certainly. Um, however, the Great Depression continued until 1939. And you could argue, as some historians have, that Adolf Hitler did more to solve the American economy, economic problems, by starting World War II, that is, than did Franklin Delano Roosevelt or even Herbert Hoover himself. Um, Roosevelt, nevertheless, was influenced by radical economists. One of the biggest known one was a guy named Rexford Tugwell, and he said that the Depression is being prolonged by the government not doing enough to deal with people's lack of earnings. Okay? Um, 8% of families earn 42% of the nation's wealth. And the government does very little until well into the Depression, almost five years into the Depression, before the Revenue Act of 1935 actually increases income tax to 75% for those in the top 1% or 2% of the earners in the American economy. And as a result, the government does you know, or it can be viewed as a reason, a major reason, if you will, for the prolonging of the Great Depression. So with that in mind, we move on to Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He becomes the longest serving president in American history. He's elected no fewer than three times. Um, and Roosevelt holds the presidency from, in effect, from 1934 to 1945. He leads the United States through the Great Depression and World War II. And the legislative program that we will look at, the New Deal, and this is probably its most important consequence, is that it greatly expands the role of federal government in American society. Much of the programs and much of the things that are set up during the New Deal are still with Americans today. They still operate. Um, uh, they still operate. In effect, the new the New Deal became a lasting change to um, the role of the federal government in American life. Um, what is the New Deal? Well, it's difficult to describe. It's not a coherent set of policies. In many cases, and this is a very good exam question, thus it's been asked, the degree to which the New Deal resembles a coherent set of policies are the ones that are just sort of ad hoc responses to needs at the moment or opposition to Roosevelt. So, for instance, the Social Security Act is a less ambitious version of something known as the Townsend Plan. Don't worry, we'll cover that later. Um, the wealth tax is clearly designed to co-op support from a guy named Huey, Huey Long, who's challenging Roosevelt on the radical left and his quote-unquote share of the wealth program. So there's all sorts of different ideas about why and how the different aspects of the New Deals come, come together. And actually, I should mention at this point, there is what's known as the First New Deal, which we'll talk about almost immediately next lesson in fact and then there is the second new deal which is the lesson to follow which is the really roosevelt's later policies moving towards his second um uh, uh federal election and um the i guess the policies that are aimed at continuing to intervene to prevent the worst of the great depression which is dragging on and on and on so who is roosevelt Background, number one, uh, he's a New Yorker. By 1928, he was governor of New York. And as governor of New York, he was noted as a reformer. He's one of the few people in the nation who, at the outset of the Great Crash and into the Great Depression, can be really seen as somebody who is forward-thinking, going to do something dynamic and new. For instance, as it governor of New York, he modernized the prison system and turned it away, uh, really away from the Victorian model into a prison system that's designed on reforming inmates so that they can return to society as better people rather than just punishing them for their crimes until that punishment is, if, if in effect, expired. He also was one of the first people who tried to appoint all of the people to his office uh, based on their skill, not based on party loyalty, nepotism, how much money they donated to his campaign. Um, Roosevelt is not an intellectual. In fact, a lot of people consider him about, among the most average in terms of overall intelligence of all American presidents. In fact, his, light, his, his wife, Eleanor Roosevelt, was often 
oftentimes regarded as infinitely more intelligent than her husband. That said, Roosevelt's greatest skill was his ability to listen to those that were intelligent. He created around him what he called a brain's trust, and his presidency is characterized by Roosevelt consulting the experts and listening and taking the advice um, of the experts that he thinks is most practicable in the situation. Many of this brain's trust, for instance, convince them that government should intervene directly to combat their depression, and the brain's trust is heavily, heavily influential in the early aspects of the New Deal, and I'll talk about that a little bit later on. Also, one of the things that really put Roosevelt to the forefront and maybe made him a potential president was the fact that he was a very interventionalist governor of New York. As governor of New York, he institutes the Temporary Emergency Relief Administration, which gave $20 million of the state's money to the poor, and it was financed by raising taxes, state taxes, on the most wealthy. It was a temporary measure and never intended to last forever, but it's the first example of a state-run relief effort in the nation, and for many, convinced them that if he became president of the United States, he could do something on a national level by, I don't know, taxing the rich and giving it to the poor, a little bit of Robin Hood style policies um, that would help with the poor suffering during the worst of the Great Depression. The election of 1932 is an interesting one. It's really a landslide for Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Hoover himself uh, fights a dispirited campaign. In fact, Hoover barely campaigns at all. He was basically too busy working day, day and night, in effect, combating the worst of the Great Depression. Um, Hoover himself would give all sorts of contradictory statements. Sometimes he would advocate against regulation, and in other days, maybe in another state or in a different time, sometimes even in the same day, he would ask for bold experimentation, meaning that the government needs to try lots of different things. Roosevelt, on the other hand, remained consistent. And he said things that started to capture the imagination of the people. He started talking about the forgotten man. He, he started talking about a new deal for the American people. I pledging you a new deal. The government will be different. We'll do more. And the new deal, almost by accident, in effect, becomes the name of his program of legislation when he becomes president of the United States aimed at combating the worst of the Depression. He also showed he meant business. He broke with traditional norms. When nominated as a candidate for the, for the Democratic Party of the United States, Hoover would famously fly to Chicago and accept the nomination in person. This is the first time a candidate had gone to the convention to accept the nomination, and it showed he really meant business. It's a break with tradition. They used to wait at home, wait for a phone call, pick up the phone and thank people cordially, and then get on with the business of running for president. Now, he goes to Chicago, and he addresses the Democratic Party, and he says, this is what we're going to do, and I'm the man to lead you. And this is really sort of gives people a new hope. Um, but beyond hope, the, the idea that, you know, maybe he's different. Few really can point to what the man actually stands for. Historians are basically best described him as a pleasant man who, without any really major qualifications for office of the president, um, would really like him to have been president. Um, his core principles that would drive his presidency are based around the idea of bold, persistent experimentation. He said that the country needs, and unless I mistake its temper, the country demands bold, persistent experimentation. It is common sense to take a method and try it. If it fails, admit it frankly and try another. But above all, we need, we must try something. It really, in essence, it's the old saying, right? The best thing to do is the right thing. The second best thing to do is the wrong thing. The worst thing to do is nothing. And the Great Depression was required somebody to try anything, something, anything to try and alleviate the extent of this crisis. And Roosevelt was able to sell that to the American public. And, uh, public. and he may have not have entered office with really a coherent idea of what the heck he was going to do, but his commitment to being an activist, to trying something, anything, really becomes a hallmark of the New Deal. And really, when you look at the New Deal, much of which is stricken down by the Supreme Court, others which fail outrightly, it's really an example of him at least trying things. Some work, some don't. Some are with us today, some aren't. That's sort of the New Deal. It's, it's a lot of, you know, that's throwing things at the wall and hoping they stick. So why did he win um, the 1932 election? Well, number one, people blamed everything on Hoover. Toaster's broken, Hoover's fault. Unemployed, 
Hoover's fault. Hoover's laissez-faire approach was ineffective. Okay, when he does type, tend to act, it's way too late. Um, he'll raise taxes at the wrong time in 1932. He'll put on tariffs that are the wrong time. And he basically really can't get away from his own personal beliefs that the government needs to stand back. And also, at most, you can encourage public uh, companies to work together with the government. This is known as voluntarism. It didn't work in the early 1920s. It's not sufficient for the Depression. Okay, um, And also, he was humiliated. The Bonus Army March, which the government um, soldiers in the National Guard, led by Douglas MacArthur, shoot people and kill two babies, really put a nail in, in, in Hoover's coffin. Additionally, naturally, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's campaign was stronger because he campaigned hard. Hoover was busy dealing with the Depression. He didn't really want to. Um, FDR used radio. He flew around, famously going to the Democratic Convention to accept the nomination. He showed himself as dynamic. Uh, he talked about the forgotten men. He promised a new deal. He used a song called Happy Days Are Here Again, and it gave hope to the masses. And of course, he travels. He travels more miles on the campaign trail than any other candidate in U.S. history. You remember people doing back, uh, famously, I believe it was McKinley who did the uh, back porch campaign where he basically stayed in Washington the entire time. This wasn't Roosevelt. He went amongst the people who were suffering and asked for their vote, and they gave it to him. Um, also, they liked his policies. Okay, He promised concrete action. Um, he's, you know, that whole idea of a new deal. He promised things like lowering mortgage rates, reducing farm surpluses, increasing regulation of the stock market, and repealing prohibition. And all of these were popular in the 1930s. Um, not to mention the fact, though, it's, and it's important to note, that FDR's policies weren't that much different than Hoover's. And many aspects of the New Deal are based on sort of the later things Hoover was trying to do. But he wins this election more than anything because Hoover is so unbelievably unpopular that he's able to exploit this in a pretty effective campaign. His policies, in essence, are really the least important thing. He was the not Hoover guy, and he was the not Hoover guy who was everywhere. And as a consequence, he storms to victory in 1932, taking office in 1933. And as we'll learn next lesson, pledging and committing to the biggest transformation in the role of the American government in history. Uh, and that becomes, in effect, the first New Deal. And we'll talk about that next lesson. And that's all for today.